Nasi in gesprek met trots aan jou gebring dier Afgri, Monsanto, Netbank, Senbes, Engen, Graan SA en John Deere. Welkom bij Nasie in gesprek. Onze tijdens die afgelopen Nampu Oestdag weer eens gesels oor brandpunten in landbouw. Ons gaan specifiek kijken naar die gesprek wat Eusebius McKaiser van 7 uit toe in Cape Talk gehad het oor grondkwesties. Eusebius, ons luister graag. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. We are going to be talking about a range of issues in terms of land, the big land debate, if you will. And I am incredibly delighted to say that I'm joined on the stage by an esteemed panel that will be representing a variety of different views, starting from my left, Rolf Mayer needs no introduction in this country, but he is here in Transformation, in Transformation Initiative. Uh, Philly van Zell next to him from ZZ2, although my brain wants to say ZCC, that would be the wrong place for such a convention. Next to him is, of course, Prince Marcello, well known for not mincing his words, fresh from a fight at the Constitutional Court yesterday. He is a South African political analyst. Uh, on his left, uh, Johannes Moller from Agri SA, and last but by no means least the DG of the Department of Agriculture and Forestry and Fisheries, Mike Lengana, because the state is a very important discussant in this conversation. So thank you so much to all of you for, for being here. Okay, I want, to, I want us to drill down into the question of ownership as our first theme. And let's just play around with the concept of ownership. But I want to start with you, Mike. And, you know, I only met you properly on my radio show this morning on Cape Talk and 702. Um, he's got land, so I'm trying to become his BFF. Um, being a farmer yourself. But unfortunately, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with an honest public servant. It's such a rare beast, especially at DG <laughs> level. And his political principle. I had Mike on my show. I also had his minister on my show. And both of them were admirably honest on this question of title deeds, ownership, and also, you, he didn't want to use the strong word, but the minister actually conceded. He said, yes, it is a disgrace. He signed up to that word that we have 450 black commercial uh, farmers in this country. That's the number I heard last night. And, um, and you said that you've been trying to persuade colleagues at an inter-ministerial level to take more seriously the question of ownership. So why are you failing? You are in the state. You've been given power by Rulf and Cyril through the Constitution. Why haven't you done what you say we should be doing? Mike, on the question of ownership. It's a, it's a very, it's a, again, it's a very painful, painful one that us who are affected by this issue of ownership deny one another the opportunity to own, land, to own land. It is indeed, I think the minister was correct, it's a very sad admission because we all have agreed in various lehotas that land, the title deed must be given. We even put conditions. If you feel that you are going to sell the land, put a condition precedent that we are, you are not going to sell this land without offering it to me as government mm. first. What is this fear? What, what, even the ANC charter, land shall be utilized by those who own it, not those who rent it. Yet we have got Part of my, among our colleagues, those who are insistent on not trying to release land. And I think it's a debate that is maturing. Because for the first time, we are sitting inside as government officials and saying this is wrong publicly. And that was never done before. We are saying to the public, we, what you are talking about is what we also recognize. And we are working with you to make sure that this, this thing happens. And I'm definitely sure the minister is hearing this. And uh, it, they gave me a call. I would have loved him to be here because he would have spoken at least you and for, for us all to understand. And I think secondly, black farmers cannot be productive without that title deed. The 450 commercial farmers was brought by me. I'm not trying to, once I saw these emergent farmers, they are emerging all the time. I said, then let's, let's put a figure. 
And that big figure of 450 is actually 50 per province. Mm. And I sat with my team and said, where do we start? Once we agreed that this should happen, I went to the president and presented the benefits and the value proposition for doing so. They bought into it. Indeed, it is far less. It's similar to the, to the issue of jobs. To do 20, 30 vision of 1 million jobs, it's, it, and you're not contracting it to the department that should do this, and you are acknowledging that agriculture is that department that has opportunities for job creation. Yet when you get in, no one knows who's going to do it well. Mm -hmm. It's sitting there. So somehow, therefore, it, the, the public debate is allowing and saying to the government, you are accountable. Begin to be, one, transparent. Secondly, begin to do things that we voted you for. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that, that question, the last one that we voted you for, is beginning to be more realistic right now. So the inclusivity is also saying we all belong together. Mm -hmm. You have got skill. I'm trying to get this skill. Let's partner. Mm -hmm. And we have seen the results of those partnerships. And I'm here to say, even on recapping, we are going to enforce partnerships. Mm -hmm. Prince, so, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I just want to ask Johan. Johan, you told me while your face was being made up with all sorts of powder next door <laughs> in the green room that you want a practical conversation, pragmatism. Ideology is not going to get us anywhere. For those of us like myself who have very low levels of literacy when it comes to this part of the economy, can you sketch us a picture, and for the people at home, what is the impact of not giving title deeds when it comes to your desire to forge partnerships? Yeah. How does that undermine <clears throat> your willingness to form partnerships? You see, maybe let me just start at, at, at a slightly different point. You know, uh, I think in, in a lot of people's minds, land reform is just about transferring land from white farmers to black ones. I'm going to be quite frank and straight about this, but it's not. Why can't a successful black farmer not be empowered to buy land with other black or white people in, as partners and in that way promote land reform? Why are they excluded? Why are farmers in, in, in the, the former homelands excluded from, from this, uh, and, you know, from this uh, process? And that's what, what it's all about for us. And, and I fully agree, it's the basis of, of our policy that, that the partnerships should be the, at least the starting point for the next decade or whatever in, in ensuring that land reform will become an economic, economically viable uh, and, uh, process and ensure that, that we, we keep on feeding the nation during this, this, tra uh, the, this, this transfer period. Let me give you an example where I come from. Uh, there were a lot of, of small farmers uh, and, and they, all of them had land, two, three hectares of irrigation land. What we've done through, through the dried fruit technical services, our, our commodity organization, is not giving them any other land. Mo most of those farmers you know, took jobs in town and so on. And we, we've, we've trained them on the one hand, and while we were training them, we planted their land to the newest cultivars to produce raisins. The average turnover now, without getting a square centimeter of extra land, is over 500,000 rand a year. That is, that, that's a good starting point in agriculture for somebody to become successful. All of them have moved back to their, <coughs> their land as successful farmers, and they are now expanding. And that's the approach that we should be, be using. We should be training people as entrepreneurs, so that they can employ some of the unemployed people in South Africa. Coupled with, with agriculture's long value chain and, 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 uh, and also promoting uh, new technology in, of processing and, and so on, uh, in, in agriculture we can do a lot and go a long way towards alleviating uh, uh, unemployment in South Africa from agriculture view. But just giving people more land without any skills, any support, any training is not going to do it. Prince, you wanted to jump in? <coughs> I wanted to jump in because, uh, and then let me warn you, I'm going to spoil the part. I wanted to jump in because, you see, it may sound, uh, I suppose the rules of politeness will demand that we, we should be nice as panelists. 
But I think we must forget them for a minute and tell each other the truth. Hmm. Here is the truth. If you hear a senior government official speaking as if he's an NGO representative, you must know you have a big crisis as a society. When the Afrikaners in 1913 decided that they want to kick black people out of land, they want to get rid of sharecroppers, they didn't speak like NGOs. They simply passed a law. They put the weight of the state behind that. They empowered their people. In the 1920s, they pumped subsidies to, to subsidize Afrikaners. Afrikaners are farmers not because they were born farmers, but simply because they were assisted by the state. They produce skills, right? But here we are, more than two decades um, after the fall of apartheid, we have a government that speaks like an NGO, right? It can't print title deeds. I mean, if we have a state that can't print title de deeds, what more about training? In this country, you don't have a, the ANC argued uh, for a unitary state, right? Uh, there were chaps on the African side who wanted to take the, Af the free state as their folk start, right? And the EFF was actually behind, the IFP was behind that because they wanted KwaZulu Natal. The ANC now, currently, it actually runs South Africa as if we have some kind of a balkanized fo uh, folk start. We have, a, confeder <coughs> we have confed a confederation of ministries in cabinet. You don't have a government that speaks with one voice that pursues a single agenda, which is why he is a man of good heart. But he's battling to convince his own cab cabinet colleagues to address a very important issue. So we have a balkanized government whose center does not hold. Fale, I want to bring you in here, though. I mean, he's, you know, what Prince is saying, I suppose most people in this room and most people at NEMPO will probably agree with that. But let's also be honest, there's an obsession in this country with state-centric approaches towards problem solving. Rules wants to be in the solution space, um, and I think that's where we should head. If it is true, as Johani say, and as um, was said last night by Milan as well, and with the example of the Bosfeld Group, that it is possible through voluntary partnerships for commercial farmers to walk the talk, you don't need Mike to convince cabinet. And Prince can write his next book about the fall of the ANC. Oh, wait, he's already done that. <laughs> Nothing stops you legally as commercial farmers, black or white, from forming the partnerships that you wish to do. Just as the ANC has constitutional power to do more on land reform, you guys don't have to wait for JZ to come to his senses before you actually have more of these partnerships. Why isn't it happening voluntarily? Uh, it's a good question, and I, I do have an answer for it. Uh, I, but I, let, me, let me comment on what Prince has said, and I actually agree with him. The problem that we have in this country is uncertainty. Uh, and, and we can't run away from the market forces. The market forces are there. Whether we, e even in communist countries, the market forces are also at work. So if you create uncertainty, or if you allow uncertainty to happen, then progress will definitely not happen. Hmm. Money tends to run away from uncertainty. Um, so the, your, your direct question, why don't we have um, more partnerships? Our institutional framework is not conducive to forming partnerships. Uh, and I must say, it's not only, the, it's not only the, the result of government not capable. We deliberately also created an environment where people that had been removed or, f or had a claim could go and claim their rights back. Mm. And our government is, has a very painful process to go through in order to justify and cross-examine and make sure that all those painful processes are restituted. Now, like in any society, people are using the framework uh, as, as a, not, not as a very truthful process. Some people are trying to, to gain from it. So on the one hand, the government must allow the process to take its long road. But on the other hand, the government must also institutionalize uh, partnerships. The point that I'm trying to drive home is that when I say 19,000 farmers are in distress, you mustn't think of it because you and I are liberal arts students. We mean distress as an economic concept. Yeah. 
And when I say there are consequences there for the ANC, for black people, who are in a numerical majority, I'm not saying please give Philly a hug and lots of money. I'm saying why have we not, as political analysts, as writers, as a black-led government, we are not thinking through the causal consequences of these financial stress. Not because we give a damn about giving him a hug as a white man. I'm not saying care about white tears, as the young black kids would say on Twitter. What I'm saying is, does it not surprise you as an analyst, both in our work, but also just looking at the state, that we are sitting on a ticking political time bomb, which will come back to bite us in our democratic behinds if we don't care about those commercial farmers. Whether they're black or white is neither here nor there. The political effect will be the same. If, uh, Rolf, I, I want your opinion on that, and I'll give you a chance to come in, Prince, and then, um, Philly, I'll take you. I, I have a feeling, uh, Eusebius, that, that, we, that we need to change a little bit the paradigm about what are we talking about. I'm not saying mm. here, us, now. I'm talking about the general situation. Mm. The, the, the paradigm being where we're coming from is an historic one. It's the reality that, like Prince was saying, Farmland in South Africa belonged to the whiteies. That's been historically the reality. I think the change or the transformation that's required is not about transferring that to a new society. I think what is really required is, is a way of looking at what is the meaning of land in terms of the value that the majority of South Africans can benefit from. I think that is the essence of what we need to talk about. Prince was making a point. I wanted to react immediately there. He was saying the problem is that there are overcrowded spaces with people having no land. Now, as far as I know, London is a very much overcrowded place. We're very few having access to land in that space. But that's not the point. The, the point that I think is, is real here is that we have to look at how we can give value to South Africans that never have been exposed to value, whether it's land or the place they live or whatever the case is. And there's no reason, legally speaking, why South Africans that live in a shack somewhere around Johannesburg can't be given that space as their own mm. in terms of title, in terms of title. And I think we have to look at the conversation turning around towards that aspect. And in the process, if we empower South Africans in that way, then I think we will create opportunities that will flow from that. Agriculture is not a, a, a single entity within this. It's part of the bigger picture. But when we talk about land, it affects basically everybody. But you set me up nicely for, I think, on a, on a positive last note, if, if we may, uh, DG, I'm going to start with you on this one. I'll give everyone who'd like to, and you don't have to feel obliged to opine on this one, uh, to give a perspective on this issue. We do need to get more black people involved. We need to get more women involved. And two things that have opened my eyes being here for the first time at NEMPO is firstly, taking a drive around uh, the expo was just phenomenal because even as a BA student, you cannot but learn at the incredible value chain of this sector. And I think to myself, gosh, the opportunities to play along the value chain are clearly enormous, enormous, from implements to technology, all sorts of things that you need. You can be an IT boffin and find yourself at Nempo. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You know, that, that's, that was a learning moment for me. The other was, and this is not to get a bonus at Prime Media, is that <clears throat> when we ventilated these issues, and you can testify on my show this morning, we couldn't stop the calls coming in for two hours, even after you left and we had Christopher Van Rieder on. It was phenomenal. I thought I was going to bore my listeners and lose them maybe to Radio Solnit Grenze, and I didn't. <laughs> and the majority of the people who called in were young people, women, he spoke to black women farmers. Prince doesn't know they exist. They do exist. We just don't profile them in the media. So here's my question to you. What can we do practically, DG, 
to change the situation that Prince is describing. He doesn't know of the few, and they, they, they're very small statistically, so your point is right at the level of pattern. But they exist. You spoke to Koketsu this morning. She's been to your farm. You have traded war stories about farmer, farming with this young black woman, uh, and many others who called into my show, and I was, I was astounded. But behind your back, Tristo was moaning that the quality of the agriculture schools are really shocking. As a society, we don't get returns for that investment. Uh, the same uh, goes for many people who are unemployed. I had a black mom calling in saying, my son studied agriculture and now he's unemployed. I can't possibly tell you his cousin to also go and study agriculture because his cousin <coughs> is unemployed. So he's a bad example. This is a passion of yours. How do we get women involved, young people involved, so that the optics of this panel can look differently in five years' time? Yes. I know I'll just be very short, Prince. It's a, it tends to be said, it's a very sad reality that the government has not provided an enabling environment for these debates to occur and that they occur at this level. The state of affairs in agricultural colleges is extremely sad. I took a position and begged my principal and others that let's begin to take open, revitalize these colleges. Let them be a source of feed to, to whatever policy of farming, of, of, of farming. And that's what we're doing. We visited one college. The situation was sad, very, very sad. But I've made a determination to shift the budget and prioritize it for the sum of those learners who are learning in an environment where, I mean, in this cold, the whole world is not there. And I could not but feel so sad that as a responsible citizen and, and, and uh, graced by God to, 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 to be here, mm. I can't do anything on this. That's why we began. Now, those colleges, all of them were in, our, in my department yesterday, and we agreed that we are going to put steps together. Okay. And uh, include, by the way, commercial farmers, so that we can take them there for internships with the idea of opening up. The Germans were here. They literally said, we can take people from you, Mike. Just assure me that when they come back from Germany, there is a space for them. We were going everywhere begging for these guys to be skilled okay. so that agriculture in South Africa prospers, especially in rural areas. Mm. Johanna, I'm going to restrict you to 45 seconds. A final thought. Yes. You know, it must be a very attractive sector for a young potential black student to say, I'm going to study agriculture, I'm going to go through all these motions, and then I will have a 70% failure possibility, like the current f uh, commercial farmers. We're not going to sell it to them, whether we want to or not. The second thing is, if we don't get economic growth, we're going to lose the rest of the commercial farmers as well, because I cannot produce food for people without money. So we've got to change the sector, we've got to get economic growth going, we've got to make this, this uh, improve profitability in the sector, whether it's through integration in the value chain or whatever, but we've got to get those things right, and one of the key elements is, is through education and training, like Mike has said. That is the huge challenge that we're facing. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Friends, 30 seconds. Um, uh, well, this morning I was walking with my friend Pumerela outside. So we see a young uh, white chap wearing khakis, probably in his teens. I said, wouldn't it be nice to walk here and see a black guy dressed like this with his hat? And we both agreed it would be very nice. I think we must work towards that goal. Where you walk around here, you see both black and white kids wearing khakis. They are being trained to be farmers. That's number one. Lastly, we need to take these discussions out of this space and have these discussions also in black communities. Because you see, most of us in black communities, we have breakfast, lunch, we don't know where it comes from. So unless and until we get to that level, we are, we are going to have this discussion where, is it, where we don't actually see ourselves in agriculture. Mm, thank you. Ali, a final thought from the ZCC? <laughs> from the church. <laughs> uh, I, I have a controversial last word. Uh, black people in this country used to pay what they called black tax. 
And I was only introduced to this concept very recently, maybe a month ago. And I, and I was born here, so I didn't know about the, uh, the existence of this terminology. I think people in this country will be surprised to know how much white tax people are prepared to pay. It must just be allowed in a dignified way and in a fair way. Okay. Rolf, I don't know, I just like your voice. You get 90 seconds. <laughs> Here's the challenge, and I'm looking at the organizers of this event. Uh, let's all work together and help them to ensure that next year half of this audience will be black, representing an interest, a serious interest in the subject we're talking about. Mm. They've been a great panel. Honesty can often cost you, and I want to affirm their honesty. The state, commerce, print as a political analyst, and just as a gift to this country, really, as a great South African. Can we please put our hands together and thank them? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Remember to follow us on Twitter and visit uh, the website nationinconversation.co.za. Nasi in gesprek met trots aan jou gebring dier Afgri, Monsanto, Netbank, Senbes, Engine, Graan SA en John Deere.